So y'all are all ready to get your first bees. You know, some of y'all have bees, but, but many of you are, are starting on this adventure this year. And there's different ways that you can get them. You could purchase an established hive, and that's one way. Maybe that's the easiest way, a turnkey operation. You just bring the whole giant box of bees in, set it up in your backyard. Uh, it's hard to find whole entire beehives for sale. Usually it's when somebody is uh, downsizing or they're moving out of state, can't take them, or unfortunately it happens a lot when people pass away and their families say, I don't want those bees. I never wanted anything to do with them. I don't know what grandpa did with them. You can have them, take them away. Before they get moved, of course, they do need a health inspection certificate because used equipment can be a bargain, but it can come with a lot of problems, especially if nobody's been able to get out and look in those hives. They can have hive beetles and varroa mites and diseases and things like that. So before you move those in with the rest of your operation, you wanna make sure that there's not gonna be anything terribly contagious. I want you to make sure that you're not moving contagious bees around before you get into my neighborhood. So this kind of rule protects all of us uh, from, from anything accidental. It is possible to move and reestablish honeybee colonies. Our rule of thumb is less than three feet or more than three miles. And that's because your foraging bees know where everything is in a very wide area around their hive. And if you just move them a few feet, sometimes they can't find their way back home. They, they use visual landmarks to navigate long distances, but when they get close to their hive, then they use their sense of smell. So if, uh, if you brought a beehive home and you set it down right here by your back door, you thought that was gonna be great. When it was a little bitty colony, maybe that was fine, but then when it got bigger and bigger and it had lots and lots of bees and you had to walk through a cloud of bees every time you went out to feed the dog, maybe you thought that wasn't such a good idea. So you can take that hive and you can move it over by the back fence. It's only 20 feet away. They should be able to find that. You can see it from here. Well, the bees don't necessarily see things the way we do. So you could pick it up and you could move it a couple of feet, set it down, wait a few days, move it again and again and again. In a couple of weeks, you could have it back there. If you're gonna do that, it helps to place some obstacle in front of the hive. Uh, take a brightly colored lawn chair or something, set it in front of the hive. So as bees come out, they have to go around this obstacle. And then when they come back, they have to do the same thing. And, and you move that obstacle with them and that helps them to orient on that location as it changes. So you can go a little bit at a time, or if you wanna move them all at once, you have to move them more than three miles away, leave them for a while, few days, a week or two, then move them back, but put them in that new location. And when you do that, when you move them outside of that three mile range, the bees come out, they look around, they say, whoa, I've never seen any of this stuff before. They don't recognize anything, so they reorient on a new location, take in all the new landmarks, and they forget about living where they were at first. And now they, they reorient on that new place several miles away. In a week or two, you can move them back now and put them in another spot, and you can reprogram them again. You can reset their little tiny GPS. They'll completely forget about that second location. They won't remember the first location. They'll reorient on that third. This is how we can put bees on trucks, and we can take them across country, and they can pollinate different farms and orchards all over the place. It takes them a couple days to figure it out, but then they're fine. So close them up after sunset. All the bees go in the hive at night, they come back out in the morning, ideally. Now in the hot summertime, you may actually have a lot of bees hanging out outside if you don't close it up good. Sometimes you have bees on the bottom, especially if you have a screen bottom. They gather underneath, they can still smell, and they, they're, they feel like they're home, but then you reach down and you pick that hive up and you put your bare hands underneath the hive, sometimes you get a handful of bees. So close it up after sunset. Uh, if it's hot, put a screen across it. If it's uh, cooler weather, it's not such a, such a big deal. Um, in a small colony, you can just block it off if you're not going very far. Put it in the back of a truck, take it where you wanna go, set it down, give them about 10, 15 minutes to settle after all that vibration and shaking around, and then open up the entrance again. In the morning, they'll come out, they'll reorient, they'll be fine. Do strap them together nice and tight. I told you last week about propolis and how it seals the hive together and it's almost impossible to break apart. Move some bees and they'll come apart like butter. So make sure that you strap them together really good. 
Used to, you had to know all kinds of sailor's knots to tie them together with rope. These ratchet straps make it a lot easier. Uh, and uh, when you are working with bees at night, you can bring a flashlight along. If you shine that flashlight or your headlights right in the entrance of that hive, you can expect bees to come out thinking it's sunrise. And if you're wearing a headlamp, you can imagine what's going to happen there. But bees don't see the color red. If you've got a red lens on a flashlight, that, that can be good for working around bees at night. Another way to get bees is to purchase what we call a nucleus hive, or a nuke. You usually see it abbreviated as nuke. And this is just a miniature hive. Usually it's five deep frames, and uh, it's got a laying queen in there. Uh, it's got a couple of frames of brood. It's got a couple of frames of food, so there should be some pollen, some honey. Because they've got live brood that they're rearing in there, they need lots of food. They need that pollen, and so the bees are coming and going through this little door down here. They've got to have access to the outside. You can close them up for a few days, but they, they need access to the outside to get that food so they can take care of all that brood. Uh, but this closes up, you can tape them shut, you can tie them shut, and uh, you can move them around pretty easily. If you have high, if you want to go with all medium sized equipment for your brood boxes, be aware that most nukes come in deep. If you want to use a top bar hive or a Warre hive or some other non Langstroth hive, then uh, you probably don't want to start with these deep frames because they may not uh, fit into the, the hive of your choice. But you bring this home, you put it exactly where you want that beehive. So now we decided we don't want to put it here by the back door, we're going to put it out there in the corner of the yard. So set up your hive stand, a couple of cinder blocks, whatever you want, and place your, your nucleus hive right there. Open up the little door and let those bees come and go. In a couple of days, they will have oriented on that location, found all the good flowers in the neighborhood, and things are really going to start buzzing. The queen continues to lay, so the population in there continues to build up. And pretty soon, they're going to get crowded in there. I've bought nukes before that were so crowded, they were about to swarm. They were already making queen cells. I actually split one, and I got two nukes for the price of one, one year. So uh, make sure that you do check them. But uh, let them establish their foraging patterns here. And before they get too crowded and swarm on you, bring out your full-sized box, move the nuke out of the way, put that hive in, transfer each of the frames right into the middle of it, and then add some more frames that just have foundation, or if you've got some drawn comb from another hive, you can put that in there. Shake all the bees out of this box right in the top, and carry it away. Uh, some of these are, are cardboard or plastic, but they're actually pretty sturdy. Keep them around. They're very useful for catching swarms and for splitting colonies later on, so you'll definitely want to hang on to those. But uh, shake out all the bees. If you can't seem to shake them all out, just move it about 10 feet away and leave it open, and they'll fly back in. But the bees that were out returning, it's good to do this in the middle of the day, kind of between about 10 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon. A lot of your bees are out foraging, so there's fewer bees that you have to deal with. But close it up, and then when those bees come back, they look at the new hive and they say, that's not right. But they look around, they say, well, visually all the landmarks look familiar. Home should be here. And they get closer and they smell with their antennas. Yeah, this smells like my hive. And the guard bees there assure them, yeah, this is the place, come on in. That we remodeled while you were gone. Look, we got a double wide now. So they're happy, they go on in, and they'll draw out all those combs, and now that hive can expand sideways. Of course, once uh, this box fills up, then you can stack another box on, and the whole thing becomes a high rise from then on. But that's how we establish a nucleus. Now, if uh, you're using a different type of hive that doesn't take these these standard deep Langstroth frames, then you might want to start with package bees. This is three pounds of bees, scooped out bulk rate, put into a screen box. It's about the size of a shoe box, and there's a queen in there. Uh, she, she goes first class, the rest of these bees are, are just traveling coach. But down on the bee farm, they shake all the extra bees out of lots of hives, and they put them in these giant containers like this, and they mix and mingle them from all different colonies. And normally, bees don't like to mix and mingle like that. They get confused. They get a little grumpy about that. But in this case, they're outside of their own hive, and they're away from their own queens, and so uh, they'll, they'll start to get along. 
but they mix them up, they smoke them good, and this guy here is actually pouring bees down a funnel into these boxes. This fella here is watching the scale. He says, stop, that's three pounds, which is about 10 to 12,000 bees. And he takes one of these cans over here and drops it in this hole in the top. And it's, the can contains a sugar syrup, which is enough food for them to survive on for several days while it's in transit. These are all adult bees. There's no brood, they don't need pollen. And so they can survive on that. Bees will start shipping around mid-April, so around this time of year, usually. Uh, given the weather in the south, it varies a week or two either direction every year, but it's usually about this time when we start to expect them. Uh, so this is also when we start to see swarms. They will deliver them right to your mailbox if you want. Uh, they'll tell you when to expect them, especially as the date gets closer. They may call you and tell you we had a freeze, things are slowed down, or, or we had good, good weather, things are speeding up. Make sure you give them a good phone number, and you can actually expect the post office to give you a call a lot of times and let you know your live bees are in. Maybe you'd like to come and pick them up here at the post office, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? because for some reason it makes them nervous to be driving around with all these boxes of live bees in the back of their little trucks. If you go to the post office with that little piece of paper that says live bees, they treat you like royalty, don't they? All the rest of you guys have to stand in those long lines behind the ropes, but the live bee people, we get led to the back, see all the secret post office stuff, or you can drive around to the loading docks and they'll say, there's your bees over there, go get them because uh, they are convinced that package of bees is leaking. Because one bee flew off to the window over here, because they brought it in, they put it in a dark room, and that one bee has been on the outside of the package for weeks, well, for about a week, trying to get in. All the other bees are in there, they've got all the food, she can't get inside, but she's been riding around on the outside of the package. When they put them down in the back of a dark room with one window, she says, well, if I can't get in, I'm going back outside. And she flies out, but she can't get out through the window, so it's buzzing around, and the folks at the post office think that that package must be broken, and they don't want anything to do with it, but they're happy to let you take it away. When you bring them home, if you can't put them right in the hive, do keep them out of the sun. So keep them in a, in a cool place like your garage. Keep them in the dark. And uh, spray them down with water or with sugar water. If you don't have any sugar syrup, give them some fresh water. They usually like a nice little drink, but I like to give them some one-to-one -one sugar syrup. When you are ready to uh, put them in the hive, you can spray them down again. Gets them nice and sticky, gives them something to do, grooming each other, but they don't fly as well when they're all sticky, so it's easier to put them into the hive. They've been shipping bees like this for 150 years, so uh, it's, a, it's a pretty standard way to do it, and uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So when you get them home, it should look something like this. There's different kinds of packages. Uh, there's some plastic ones now that they use, but this is kind of the traditional kind. There may be a shipping label here. There may be a health certificate from whatever state you got these bees from. No one in Arkansas makes package bees, so they all come from other states. Uh, Georgia is a big supplier of, of package bees for us, but you just pop that off with a, your hive tool or a screwdriver, and underneath there's that can that has the, the sugar syrup, and you'll see some little metal or plastic tab over here that indicates where the queen is. There's a queen cage in there. And you'll just slide that out somehow. It may look something like this. So it's just a, a little wooden box or a plastic box, but there's a queen inside here under the screen. And she's also got four or five attendant bees, worker bees, that take care of her, they feed her royal jelly, and they make sure she's got everything she needs for the, the few days that they're being shipped. This white stuff over here on this end is, it looks like cake frosting. It's called queen candy. It's just a, a sugar candy. And these worker bees inside can eat that, but the queen doesn't really eat that. She wants the royal jelly they're giving her. And the reason she's shipped inside this, this container, well, one, it makes it easier for uh, the shippers to know where the queens are and to move them around, but we've got to keep them separate from these other bees. You've got 10,000 bees that don't know who that bee is, that queen. That's not their mama. They can tell she's a queen, but they can also tell that she's not their queen. That's not my mother, and I'll kill you if I can get my stinger on you. That's what they're saying. Now, over the several days, three or four days that they're in transit, they're losing their loyalty to their own queen. They're losing the pheromones in their own body, and they're curious about this queen in here, but they haven't accepted her yet. 
Now the bees, the, the worker bees, the attendants in here are picking up this queen's pheromone as they feed her and they can share food with these other bees on the outside of the package or outside of the cage, the other ones in the package. These are all drinking syrup out of the can and they can stick their little tongues through the screen and they feed each other. Remember bees are constantly sharing food with each other. So they're curious about these bees in here. They know there's a queen and they're interacting with those workers. And as they interact with those workers, they're passing that, that new pheromone out. And so slowly these bees on the outside from all these other different colonies are acquiring this new queen's pheromones. So this is a way to slowly introduce a queen very safely into this colony. So there's a cork in each, in each end of this cage and you pull out the one, usually the one that has the candy in it, and you expose that candy. Four bees cannot eat a spoonful of candy very quickly. 10,000 bees will nibble through that in a couple of days. So you take the cork out of that end, and you place that queen cage down in the hive. And there's different methods of doing that, and, and this is one of those things where you ask every beekeeper and you're gonna get a different, different way to do it. This is the way I like to do it with a rubber band. Just put that around the whole frame and you put that queen cage right up against it. Make sure that the screen is to the outside so that the bees can still smell and visit with uh, the queen inside. You can also do them this way, pinch it between two frames. These plastic cages are just the right size to fit between two frames. And this is uh, another smaller queen cage. Sometimes they have a little plastic or metal tab that you can hang over the top. So lots of different ways to do it, but this is my preferred method. It's never gone wrong for me. Uh, but make sure that the queen candy goes up. Sometimes people will tell you to put the queen candy down, but one of these attendant bees, sometimes she'll die and she may fall down and block that hole, and make it harder for the, your queen to get out. So if one of them dies, she'll fall down out of the way and they'll eat that candy in a couple of days and they'll let the queen out. So this is the way I would suggest to do it. Or you can lay it on its side and, and that's not an issue there. Now, here comes the fun part. Get ready to become a beekeeper. You're gonna take that can of syrup out of there and what do you think happens when you pull out that can? Something like that? <laughs> no, that never happens. That nice young lady was actually wearing a bee beard and this is a photo of her shaking the bees off afterwards. No, when you pull that can out, nothing happens. A Couple of bees buzz out and look at you. It's like being on a long road trip or a long flight. You stand up, you gotta stretch. These bees haven't stretched their wings in a long time. So you pick up this big box of bees and you gotta shake it on one side and turn it over and pound on it a couple times and shake it around. Turn it over and dump all those bees out. And you might have to tap on it a few more times and shake out as many bees as you can. But you dump them out right over that queen cage. You might take a couple of frames out, make extra space in there. If you've got the, the cage on rubber banded to one of the frames and you can pour them all right down in that space and then you can drop those frames in very gently. Push them down slow, the bees will get out of the way and go around them. But uh, once you've poured in as many as you can, just set the, the cage down there. There's always gonna be a few strays down there. Uh, one of our old bee inspectors showed me a neat trick. Just find a stick laying in your yard and put it down inside this opening and lean it up against the entrance because bees tend to crawl up when they meet an obstacle. So when they encounter that stick, they'll walk up and they'll wind up right there at the entrance. And after a few have walked up, the rest of them smell their footprint pheromones and follow them up. You may notice a lot of bees at the entrance doing this. We talked about this last week. This is her Nasanov gland. She's giving off Nasanov pheromone. And so when you, when you do this, of course, not every bee necessarily goes right in the hive. You've got a lot of them flying around that aren't sure where they belong. And as they fly around, they encounter this odor and they follow it to its source. And so you'll see a lot of bees along here saying, basically, hey, this is home. Everybody come in here. This is where we want to go. Now, if you're establishing packages in four or five different colonies right in a row, then whichever hive is furthest upwind, you may have a lot of drift towards that one. You may find that one of them attracts more bees than the other ones, but usually it doesn't make much of a difference. But once they're in there, close it up and now you're in business. Congratulations, you're a new beekeeper. There's one step we forgot though, we wanna feed our bees. These bees have a big job to do, and that is to draw comb. 
we've given them nothing but foundation, either sheets of beeswax or sheets of plastic with a little bit of wax on it. So they have to consume a lot of sugar in order to produce all the beeswax they need to get going. Um, if you bought a beekeeping kit, a lot of times you'll get something like this little plastic base, or it might come with a jar. This is a, an entrance feeder or a boardman feeder. It just slides right into the entrance and the bees walk in underneath. And just like that can that came with your package bees, it has tiny little holes in the bottom and a little bit of syrup drips out at a time. So these bees uh, can come underneath and get a droplet at a time and carry it back in. They don't have to go very far. As a beekeeper, you can tell when that level drops and it's real easy to just pull the jar off and put another one on. And uh, you, can, you can see it from your kitchen window. You look out and say, oh, I need to feed the bees. And you'll be amazed at how quickly they can suck that stuff down when they're drawing comb. Well, there's a lot of different versions of that. Some of them uh, go in the entrance. Some of them go up on the top. One thing about uh, entrance hives, our entrance feeders, in the summertime, if it's really hot and dry and there's not a lot of flowers in bloom, sometimes these encourage robbing behavior. So you get bees from other colonies that come because they can easily get right in the entrance and, and get, those, uh, get to the syrup. And if they run out of syrup, then they may try to get back in the hive and, and steal some of the honey. Not an issue in the springtime. There's so much food out there uh, in the garden, but in the summertime, occasionally that can be a problem. Uh, so you can put, mount these on top of your hives. You can also put them uh, right over the hole in the inner cover and put another, another hive over it and cover it up. Uh, like this, you can put several jars inside. You can put these boardman feeders inside. People have all kinds of methods that they've devised. Uh, you can look online, search up how to feed bees, and you'll come up with a million different solutions. Some of them set them right inside on top of other frames if you've got a two-story hive. Uh, and you can do the same thing there. For If you really want to feed your bees a lot, maybe your, your bees are located quite a distance from your house, you can't necessarily get out there every day, uh, they make these pail feeders, so you can put a whole bucket, either a gallon or a, even a couple of gallons out there at a time. And again, this just, it's got a special opening there that drips very slowly and your bees can feed from that. Uh, if you don't have any kind of feeder at all, you can make one from a Ziploc baggie. So get one that seals up really well and fill it up with syrup and you lay it down right on top of the frames and of course in this case you'll you'll need another hive body or something uh, you can build a wooden spacer just to give them enough room for that take a razor blade or an exacto knife or anything like that and you cut some little slits in the top you would expect it to just gush out but it doesn't you have to poke it a couple times and eventually a little bit will dribble out and your bees just climb right up on top and they'll line up at those slits and they'll feed on that and the whole bag just kind of deflates underneath them and then you can peel it up and put another one down. So uh, that's a, a convenient way to feed them if you don't have any extra equipment to, to go. But make sure that they are sealed up really well before you put them on the front seat of your pickup truck and go bouncing down a dirt road. This is uh, called a division board feeder. Uh, this is some Pretty, pretty old technology. These have been around for a long time, but they've improved them recently. Um, they usually have a float or something inside that the bees sit on while they drink. Otherwise, you get a lot of drowned bees. Some people will cut a big piece of window screen to set in there. They can climb up and down. But some of the newer ones have these little, little ladders. So there's a, kind of a little mesh tube, and they can crawl down in that and come back out without uh, the opportunity for too many of them to drown. That's what these are here. But uh, these can be good in the winter time. You just slide the cover over, fill them up, slide it back, and that way you don't have to open up the entire hive. You'll find that bees will cluster right here next to it, and they can go down and feed and, and come back if you have to give your bees some emergency food in the winter. Um, these are hive top feeders. Uh, again, these are good if you, if you can't get out to your bees very often. You can give them a lot of food at once, but they can come up from underneath. They can feed and they can go back down. Uh, there's different types. Some of these have a little wooden raft that floats so the bees can come up in the middle, go down and, and go back. Sometimes these can be useful. You can feed syrup on one side and you could put a pollen patty on the other side and give them some protein so you can feed them different things at once. But uh, they're easy to fill up. You just open the lid, pour in a gallon of syrup, close it up. 
Um, these will get moldy if you're feeding a lot of syrup at once. It can get moldy if you don't put in uh, an additive. There's different things that they, they add to it. Uh, some people put in lemon juice. Some people actually put in just a little bit of bleach. Not enough to, to hurt your bees, but it will keep it from going moldy. And there's other stuff uh, like Honey Bee Healthy is a product that has a different uh, essential oils in it. It's like lemongrass oil and wintergreen oil. And that gives the syrup an odor that your bees find irresistible because uh, plain sugar water does not have uh, much of an odor. They don't necessarily find it, but you add some of this essential oil blend to it and they find it right away and it really draws them up there and makes them want to take that syrup. And it also keeps it from uh, getting moldy. A lot of commercial beekeepers will do what's called open feeding. So they'll just have uh, 50 gallon drums of uh, high fructose corn syrup sitting out there. There may or may not be a, a float in here to, to keep the, the bees from drowning. If you've got thousands of hives, of course, going around and putting a little Ziploc baggie in the top of each one is a lot of labor. Uh, so that's why they resort to systems like this. But this can also spread disease and this feeds all of your neighbor's bees if you've got anybody close. You can do it on a smaller scale like this, but uh, it's not necessarily something that's recommended if you've got a lot of other beekeepers around. There's one disease in particular called Nosema, which is a, a, a fungal parasite that lives inside the bee's intestine. And if you've got a case of that in one of your hives, it can easily spread to a lot more if you're doing a situation like this. But you wanna feed your bees well starting out. They've got no honeycombs at all. They've gotta draw them all out. They've gotta build the furniture for their house before they can do anything else. Before the queen can lay eggs, before they can store pollen, before they can store nectar, they've gotta draw out that comb. And so after you have fed them, you put them in there with the queen, leave them alone for about three days. You can sit out there and watch them all day, watch them coming and going, but don't disturb them. Let them get used to where they are, let them orient, and let them let, get used to their new queen. Usually by about the third day, they've accepted her and they've chewed through that candy, they've let the queen out. So you can open it up, remove that cage, and check out the combs that they've started building. A lot of times, wherever this queen cage was, that's where all the bees gather. They want to be around that queen. They start building comb around that, and sometimes they actually seal the, the, the queen cage right to the foundation. So you, want to, you have to peel that off of there, and you may actually break the, the comb. If you've got beeswax foundation, a lot of times you can, you can break a hole in it, or you'll just damage something. If you do damage it, that's okay. They'll rebuild it, but they depending on how badly you've hurt it, they may build it back in a weird way. So if I do that, I like to take that frame out and I'll move it all the way over to the very edge of the hive and, and push everything back into the middle and leave that damaged one outside on the edge and let them start over again, building good combs in the middle. But go through and, and make sure that the work they're doing is looking good. Sometimes they do weird stuff. If they start building comb down from this wooden top bar that's not attached to the foundation, you gotta, you gotta nip that in the bud. Take your hive tool and cut all that off. Don't let them keep doing that and uh, make sure that they're building on the foundation. But you'll see that the, the cells start to deepen. They get about, about a half an inch deep on each side and continue to give them syrup as long as they're drawing out comb. Keep feeding them. You can't feed them too much when you're, you're first getting started. Later on, when they're collecting honey for you, you don't wanna be feeding them. You want honey to be from a floral source. You don't want to be giving them sugar water for that. If you can, spot the queen. That's real easy, right? It's like playing Where's Waldo. Remember those books? Some of you probably spotted her right off. She looks so different than the other bees. If I do that, now you can see her. It's hard to unsee her once you have, but if you put a dot of paint on her or you purchase a queen that's got a dot, it's a lot easier to spot her. When they're all still in a photo like that, it's one thing, but when you've got 10 frames, you have no idea which one she's on and they're all moving, then it can be a little bit more difficult. So for your first hive, purchase a marked queen. And then remember, practice on drones so that you can get good at, at marking them yourself. Because sometimes you'll find a queen, you may have purchased a, a queen and she's marked and you've seen her for weeks. And then you go in there one day and you can't find her, but there's an, another queen and you think, huh, how did she rub that dot off of her? 
but could be that you had a swarm or they, they superseded, replaced her, but go ahead and, and mark that new queen. You'll be glad that you did. So continue feeding as long as they're building combs. These bees are doing a, something called festooning. They're holding hands. They kind of link their, their legs together, their feet together, and they hang in these chains when they're building comb. There's different ideas about why they do that, but they're passing little beeswax flakes to each other that they secrete from their abdomens, but I think they're also using gravity. Uh, they kind of hang in these U-shaped chains and they're using gravity to find exactly where down is so that they can build their combs exactly perpendicular to that. Because they know in nature if they build a comb crooked that it's going to snap off once it's full of honey. So they, they try their best to, to build them straight up and down. But about once a week is all you need to be in that hive. You don't need to check them every day. The bees know what they're doing. All you need to do is make sure that they're doing it right. Make sure they're not building any weird comb. Make sure that the queen is there, that she's healthy. Make sure that they are still drawing comb out. Make sure that they don't need any more food. But about once a week in the springtime is good. You don't want to go too long because they can raise a new queen and swarm on you in 16 days. So uh, that's not going to be an issue this year when you first get started probably, but in the future you'll have to watch out for that. So about once a week in the springtime. You can go and see what they're doing from the outside. Watch the bees coming and going and see how many of them are carrying pollen. This is always a good sign. When bees are moving pollen in, then they're raising brood. The more pollen you see, the better. The more different colors of pollen you see on their legs, the better. Because they're getting a diverse diet from a lot of different plant sources. So we like to see that. Inside, hopefully the queen is laying eggs. Within about 24 hours of coming out of that queen cage, she's already mated, she's ready to go, she wants to find cells to lay in. So in the few days that it takes for them to release the queen, hopefully they're drawing out a few, few honeycomb cells from your foundation and they are going to provide her with a place that she can go and start laying eggs. Ten days after she's released, you should be able to see a little patch of capped brood. This means that they've gone through the whole larval stage and now they're sealed up, they're pupating, and they're going to come out and within three weeks of the queen laying, you're going to start seeing more bees. Now when you start from a package, you'll see all of this taking place. When you start with a nuke, they're in all different stages and so you're, you're not going to necessarily see this, this progression. But if you start from package bees, you'll have a population of bees that's going to shrink because packages have a lot of old bees. They're already past their prime, and you're going to see a, a, a decrease in population. But then after about three weeks, it's going to start to boom again as this cat brood begins emerging. And so you can, you can make sure that, that they're getting ready for that. Mm -hmm.